All right. Hi, everyone. Welcome back. Um, glad to have you with us. Uh, I, just to tee up our topic today for our, our panel discussion with our, when we talk every year with our program committee, uh, you know, the, the question of, of privatization and P3s uh, and how that plays into financing uh, always seems to, to come up and be a topic that we want to bring into the Water Finance Conference. And uh, I really think uh, this, this panel that we have together this year, I, I feel like we're going to we have an opportunity to cover it as, as well as we ever have in the past. Uh, so what we wanted to do, uh, obviously the, the title of this panel discussion, public or private, the future of water wastewater management. Uh, my thinking was to sort of present some of the pros and cons of, of publicly owned and unoperated utilities versus uh, privatization, uh, investor owned utilities. Um, and, and so we're gonna get into a lot of that. Uh, once again, if anybody has any questions as we're, as we're going through some of these discussion points, feel free to submit questions, and I'll go ahead and uh, and uh, throw some of those at our at our panelists here. So I'm going to introduce uh, each of our panelists. Uh, first, we have Mariana Holden, Commissioner of the New Jersey Board of Public Utilities; Andy Kraken, Managing Director at Moonshot Missions; Robert Paulson, President and CEO of the National Association of Water Companies. Bill Tetchmiller, CEO of the EJ Water Cooperative. And once again, we have Jason Mum joining us uh, from FCS Group. So I'm gonna ask each of these, uh, each of our panelists to, to give a brief introduction on some of their, uh, on, on first of all, their, their current role and some of their work currently as it uh, relates to, um, you know, like I said, kind of the, the question of uh, publicly managed uh, water, wastewater utilities versus kind of the in, investor owned. Uh, model. So, Mariana, I will start with you. Great. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, as I was told, I am a commissioner on New Jersey Board of Public Utilities, but I come to this little conference from a, perhaps a different point of view is that I also was a councilwoman for 10 years and a mayor for four years of the borough of Madison, New Jersey which owns its own electric utility, water utility, and is a joint owner with, in a wastewater treatment facility. So I had the pleasure of uh, managing those for 14 years, uh, along with uh, trying to be involved in just about every department of the borough and showing how they're all interrelated. So public safety, health, and engineering. Um, so I wore many hats and we do the same at the Board of Public Utilities in, in a, some respect in that uh, we are, um, yeah, we have many different sectors that we regulate besides, of course, water and, and wastewater. Um, but the uh, whole idea for both roles is transparency, consistency, and predictability. And that's what we try to portray. All right, very good. Andy, I'll come to you next. Uh, thanks very much, Andrew. Appreciate the opportunity to participate and uh, looking forward to working with my fellow panelists as well. Um, I uh, served for 34 years at the Camden County Municipal Utilities Authority, which is a, a wastewater utility in Camden, New Jersey. And during that period of time, we undertook a, uh, a very massive regionalization project in which we consolidated 52 public uh, wastewater treatment plants into one uh, system with one large treatment plant. Also, uh, underwent a privatization process, which we ended up uh, not selecting and, and staying public through uh, internal efficiencies and improvement. And then also uh, assisted the city of Camden with a privatization conduct operations process, which I helped to oversee. And also during my time with the utility, we did a number of P3 projects, which are sort of a hybrid of you know, public-private partnerships, such as you know uh, solar panel installations and uh, conduct op partial conduct operations, et cetera, design build, and so I'm familiar with those sorts of things. Um, also served on the NACWA board for a few years, and so have a really good uh, sense of the uh, questions of governance. It's very important to the, to the public sector, of course, as well as the private. Um, and then I currently serve as a manager director at Moonshot Missions, a nonprofit formed by George Hawkins, the former head of DC Water, to help underserved communities uh, with water issues. All right, very good. Rob? Uh, good afternoon. Uh, Rob Powelson from the National Association of Water Companies. I serve as president and CEO. By way of background, uh, NAWC represents all private water companies here in the U.S. 
and we've been around since 1895. Prior to joining NAWC, I served as a Federal Energy Regulatory Commissioner, and then from 2008 uh, to 2018, was a commissioner and chairman of the Pennsylvania Public Utility Commission. Uh, like my good friend from the Garden State, Commissioner Holden, spent a lot of time regulating water and wastewater systems across the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. And along with my good friend, Commissioner Holden, I chaired the NARUC Water Committee um, and passed that baton on to her as it went on to bigger and better things. So I look forward to our conversation here today and appreciate the opportunity to join everyone. Very good. Bill, come to you next. Yeah, Bill Teichmiller with uh, EJ Water. Um, we're a uh, non-for-profit cooperative, uh, so we're, we're, we're always in the water space, uh, not as well known as a, another uh, uh, governance model, uh, but like in the electric uh, world and telecom, much more familiar uh, piece of governance. I've uh, been at the utility about 18 years. Uh, we, aside from doing water, wastewater, we contract manage about 25 other small utilities. We're predominantly, we're a rural system in rural Illinois, uh, but we have a fairly large uh, footprint. So uh, we, we, we kind of bring, in, in our opinion, the best of both worlds in that, you know, we're, we're very mission driven, just like a municipality, but then we, we function more like a business. Um, and so, uh, you know, the heartbeat of our organization is we're very much on innovation, uh, taking advantage of new technology, uh, extremely heavy in training uh, our workforce, and uh, and really meeting the challenges uh, that that are out there, especially for smaller communities. Because one of the biggest things that we see is uh, the long-term sustainability and reliability of 50,000, you know, small water systems in Illinois alone. There's over 5,000 uh, small, and most of them are all small utilities. So the big challenge is how do you scale up costs, procurement. Uh, meet regulations, um, have a workplace that uh, can afford to uh, provide, you know, uh, retirement and, and all the things that people would like to have to build their families long term. So we're kind of bridging a lot of those gaps. Uh, and, and we've acquired probably uh, nearly 20 different, you know, smaller utilities as we've grown and rolled up. Uh, so mergers and acquisitions is a, is a pretty big part of our business, but it's only when the community decides that's a, a direction that they want to go. Um, and similar to, to what Robert's mentioning with the, with the privates, I mean, there's really three uh, continuums, if you will. You, you've got more of the muni public ownership governance model. Uh, of course, you can do an investor-owned model. Uh, in our case, the non-for-profit co-op model, uh, is a, it's a non-for-profit. Uh, we have access to a lot of the same funding that the munis uh, enjoy. But one key difference is our actual member customers own us. So there's no shareholders. Uh, there's no profit motive in what we're doing. Uh, and so we have a big time transparency with our board of directors who are voted by the members and that's how we are governed. So that's quick and down and dirty of that. Sure, and uh, Jason, if you wouldn't mind, uh, maybe just kind of reiterate your uh, your background and, and perspective, uh, you know, coming at this, this topic. Sure, uh, Jason Lum, I am a principal consultant with FCS Group, which is a firm that focuses really exclusively in the local government area of uh, really with utilities and general government on topics related to finance, economics, management, consulting. A lot of my work deals with uh, developing utility rates and charges. I'm the uh, current chair of the American Water Works Association Rates and Charges Committee. And uh, a good part of my 24 years experience has dealt with uh, issues related to regionalizing, consolidating, um, not so much privatizing, but uh, but it has been an option in certain cases. And uh, you know, I'm interested to sit on the panel to offer that kind of perspective to the group as we uh, as we journey on here. Absolutely. And uh, so as we as we talk about our, our sort of main topic here, you know, public versus private, um, you know, First of all, maybe that's the wrong way to, to frame it. I know it's kind of a, you know, putting it in simple terms and these are these are not, uh, you know, simple equations, uh, you know, as Jason talked about in his opening presentation, uh, you know, consolidate, consolidation of utilities. This is, uh, this is, this, this is a very complex and, uh, you know, you all just listening to your introductions, you all have just a, a ton of experience, uh, you know, in, in multiple facets of the industry here. So if I'm, 
if I'm framing any of these questions in incorrectly, uh, feel free to, to correct me here. Uh, I'm just going to, you know, throw some high level questions at you and uh, we'll, we'll see where the discussion goes. Um, I, I want to start off maybe with a, you know, a simple question to, to set the stage. Um, you know, it seems to me there's obviously a, a number of ways that, uh, you know, utilities um, fund projects uh, with with rates primarily be the being the primary funding source. Um, so what is fundamentally different about the way public utilities fund capital improvement programs and other projects versus how it's done uh, by, by private investor owned utilities? Uh, Commissioner Holden, you want to go first? Well, I can wear both hats here. Um, on the municipal side, you have uh, state revolving loan funds in New Jersey. It's an uh, infrastructure trust fund that you can tap into. Um, I was fortunate enough for 20 years, Madison has been a AAA bond rated community. So we would usually go to market on our own and do better than going through the investment uh, trust fund. Um, many of the uh, challenges though aside from madison is a lot of utilities um public municipal utilities don't do cost of service studies it's just what can we do to get by um how much can we take out of uh the utility to use to keep our taxes low and it becomes much more political um one of the fortunate things in new jersey is that all the things that the board of public utilities requires of the investor-owned utilities, the same must now be done by the municipals. That was a an act that was enacted three years ago, the Water Quality Assurance Act. Um, but it still doesn't get to the heart of, I guess, what we're really going to talk about today is infrastructure funding and that capex. And no one really is overseeing those municipal or MUAs and their infrastructure. You have the, the Department of Environmental Protection that uh, talks addresses water quality, um, but for the investor-owned utilities, it's not only the water quality, but the board also oversees the infrastructure. So it's much more um, oversight. Um, investor-owned utilities, uh, of course, like to build up what they call their rate base, um, and we oversee that on behalf of the customer, make sure it isn't being gold-plated, that it's what's necessary, and they have, um, there will be two um, uh, mechanisms that will be available, hopefully by the end of this year. One already is in place is the distribution system improvement charge, which uh, it can accelerate above what you would normally do for your CapEx. And we're hoping to have a similar thing um, for the wastewater this year. Um, wastewater is a, a much smaller part of the business, but it's the growing part of the um, investor-owned business. Um, you know, in the other with municipalities, you know, if they can group together and um, they can try to get projects that are set up or planned out, uh, we were very fortunate by being one of the first to do an asset management plan that we said, well, you know, we need this digester cover done. The other digester really needs to be done. and. Fortunately, we had those plans in place, so they were shovel ready. And when ARA funds became available, we were able to do two projects at once. So it's being ready to grasp that opportunity when the funds are there. And there certainly are, there is money out there to be had at very good rates right now for infrastructure. Sure. And uh, so Andy, I'll, I'll come to you next on this one. Uh, you know, what do you see as, as kind of the fundamental differences between how Public utilities will will fund infrastructure projects versus, um, you know, the investor-owned model. Obviously, kind of speaking to your your end of things. Thanks, Andrew. Um, I think the biggest difference is that uh, the public entity uh, does not and cannot seek a profit, whereas the private entity you know, must seek a profit. And that doesn't mean that they're evil. Uh, if an entity were to not seek a profit, then they would be taken you know, over, or you know, and so it's just a, it's market driven. So profit needs to be. Uh, included and so therefore, if a public entity can be as efficient, like in the example of Commissioner Holder and Holden and Madison, or Bill Tech Miller's example in EJ Water, if the public entity can be conscientious and efficient, then because it doesn't seek profit, it can implement projects more cheaply. Um, the second thing, so I think, and you'll hear me say this quite a bit. I think the ideal model is the 
the, the hybrid of a pu public utility harnessing the private sector efficiency model for the public good. That's what that's where I think the public gets the best. They get the efficiency and they also get the, the cheaper price without profit included. And also the public utility can and, and is, is created uh, for the purpose of the public good. And I'll say more about that in a second. Uh, the second thing, as Holden indicated, public utilities qualify for low interest loans, the state revolving fund, in some cases, principal forgiveness or even grant funding. Uh, so they have those those kinds of opportunities. And for example, if a public utility like the, the utility I ran in Camden uh, does seek efficiency and does um, you know look for projects in which capital improvements can reduce operating costs, uh, they can do it in a way without raising rates. So I, I took over the finances of our utility, the management of our utility in 1996, and our rate uh, was for 500,000 people was $337 per household per year in 1996. And when I left the authority in February, it was 352. So it only went up 4% total in 24 years, but we rebuilt the entire wastewater treatment plant, significantly improved environmental performance by judicious use of the state revolving fund, some grants and also internal efficiencies. So I do think that when a public utility seeks to, be, uh, seeks to opt optimize its efficiency, uses the judicious funding of available uh, sources like the state revolving fund uh, mainly, uh, it can then hold its rate, which I don't think any, you know, many private utilities or public utilities could do unless they're seeking, uh, again, that efficiency. Uh, the other thing, the last thing I'll mention, I'll, I alluded to earlier, is that the public utility can look for triple bottom line benefits and can look from the standpoint of not only the bottom line of cost, but also environmental benefit and community benefit uh, and therefore, it, it, because it's created to do so. So I think that the public utility, can, to summarize, can be efficient, can use available funding to uh, hold down uh, costs and rates, does not need to look for profit, in fact, can't look for profit, and can and uh, it can uh, implement projects from the lens of triple bottom line benefit. Thank you. Sure, thanks, Andy. And uh, and Rob, I'll come to you next. Um, you know, obviously your your background being more in the uh, kind of the energy regulatory sector, you know, prior to being with NEWC. Um, but, you know, kind of based on your, your current role now, what are you seeing as, uh, you know, some of the benefits of uh, the investor owned model in terms of, you know, funding infrastructure based on, or, or you know, as opposed to what happens on the, the public side? Yeah, Andrew, let me start. I think it's the, you know, for those of us that are, uh have read Seth Siegel's book, Troubled Waters. I think it starts with, in this country, many people don't realize this, but you know, having 51,535 water systems, drinking water systems, is an inefficient model. You, know, you start with the fact that on our electric grid, we only have 3,200 approximate electric distribution systems and about 1,000 gas LDCs uh, here in the country. And at the water side, 51,535. And then you overlay that with about 14,500 permanent uh, wastewater systems. So we have a fragmentation problem and that leads into efficient deployment of capital into these systems. I think we all recognize on this call, look, it, it's uh, by all reasonable metrics, you know, to fix the water grid if Congress were gonna write the check you know, over the next decade, we're looking at about a trillion dollars of spend. In our industry, as Commissioner Holden mentioned, I mean, everything that is driven for an investor-owned utility starts with economic regulation. We earn a rate of return that is set by a public utility commission to a public input process. And you go through that through a rate case. And these are, you know, as I like to say, you know, investor-owned water utilities are highly regulated but they're also highly efficient. You know, when you earn a rate of return for every mile of a, a pipeline investment, you are incentivized, not the gold plate, as Commissioner Hold mentioned, you are incentivized to, from an asset management perspective, maintain, uh, I call it world-class infrastructure investment. And the reason I say that is, look, we're all in the business. I don't think anybody on this call, it, it, it's in our corporate ethos to provide safe, and reliable and affordable water and wastewater service to our customers, our, our end users, if we want to use our economic terms. And I don't think anybody on the call, whether you're, you represent rural uh, or you're, you're you know, in the city of Camden, 
um, or your DC water, that is your corporate ethos. You don't cut corners, you don't compromise on that. And so I look forward to the conversation because again, I think what we're seeing today, and here we are in the world of COVID, and I need not remind anybody on this call, but I mean, city governments, just by way of background, as they're setting their, as, as they've set their budgets, I just use an example, US cities are going through an exercise right now of ratcheting back uh, CapEx budgets for municipal authorities. And, and I'll just share the numbers with you, they're alarming. San Diego water CapEx is facing a 49.5% reduction. The city of Charlotte, North Carolina is approximately a 36% cut. Rochester, New York, 49%. Pasadena, California, 87%. That's the reality of uh, what's facing local and state governments today. As investor-owned water utilities, we haven't missed a beat in deploying capital, replacing meters, doing physical and cyber security. And so we are out there, as I call it, doing the boring good in making sure customers have no interruption of service. And that in this day and age of affordability, uh, I think we have a very valid value proposition to customers. Yeah, very good. And I think we'll dig a little deeper into some of that uh, as we go on. Um, but Bill, come, coming to you next, what are your sort of, as I mentioned, kind of your, your thoughts on the, the basic differences between public infrastructure funding and, 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 and the private model? Yeah, we're, you know, similar to what's been talked about on the public. I mean, we, we have access to the SRF program. Um, we've also have a, had great access uh, with the USDA uh, Rural Development Program. And uh, we grew with the utility to be the second largest borrower uh, with USDA up until recently, we just did a $22 million refinance. Uh, then our other big partner is CoBank, which is a uh, rural uh, cooperative bank, a very large uh, infrastructure bank, um, mainly used in agriculture, but they have a very heavy influence uh, in the uh, telecom, uh, electric and, and water. Uh, and so those have been our primary you know, sources of funding. And of course, uh, what's been talked about, um, you know, we, our portfolio, because uh, we have a debt portfolio that we monitor, uh, you know, thankfully, interest rates continue to drop and we've been taking advantage of those situations, uh, again, uh, because our heartbeat, you know, the board I report to are our members and, and, and really almost all of our board are business owners. And so it's a different type of non-political discussions that we get into. Uh, we're all about how do we keep rates affordable and how do we keep rate increases uh, modest? Um, especially in a rural, and, and many of our areas are, you know, impoverished and, and, and have low income areas. So uh, very sensitive about that. So one of our strategies has been, of course, re refunding, refinancing, you know, as those opportunities uh, come. But then also in the last uh, probably 10, 12 years, we've, we've re been diversifying our revenue stream, uh, mainly through contract services. And as I mentioned earlier in, in our call, you know, we're doing business now at, with about 25 other smaller utilities, uh, managing them, running them, doing the billing, all those types of services. And then here about, uh, we're going into our third year, we got into doing fiber to the home. Um, a lot more money in fiber to the home uh, than water. And so, you know, our, our long-term vision of that business is that probably in 10 years, because believe it or not, that's the payback. It's a 10-year payback on fiber, on CapEx, uh, we're planning on utilizing that revenue stream to help offset what we foresee as a, you know, like Rob was mentioning earlier, these, this budget, we haven't seen what is coming. Um, not only local governments are faced with enormous budget challenges. I think, of course, I don't want to get in the election that's going to happen here really soon, but it's going to be a, a real telling story how we handle infrastructure. And, and it's my view and, and others in my network that we think water, wastewater, right, wrong, or indifferent, is going to take a back seat to much higher, more uh, politically charged issues to solve. And it's going to be for all of us on this panel and even in your, in your conference to figure out how do we do our path forward, because I just don't see the check coming out. So, you know, like Rob was mentioning, the inefficiency and lack of scale by a huge bifurcation of our, you know, if, if you were to start the water business today, you wouldn't do what we've done as a nation. And it was just because of default. It wasn't on purpose. This is just what we have. And so there's an opportunity 
uh, to regionalize and consolidate uh, be only just to keep rates affordable and to maximize the appropriate infrastructure. You know, what's been talked about earlier about asset management, we're crazy about asset management here, just like most people would, because, you know, when you have hundreds of millions of dollars invested in public funds, uh, in our case, you know, most of it's uh, USDA funding, you know, you, you take that serious. And so we have to make the dollar stretch as fat, you know, long as we can. And, and I'm a nut on preventative maintenance. Uh, but that's also a difference of like why our assets tend to outperform. A lot of our municipal and these are smaller municipalities are really challenged in that because politically it's it's extremely hard for the city council sometimes to sit on a ton of money for, say, a big plant upgrade or or, or you know changing out a water tower or whatever all that stuff is. And they they politically can't keep their hands off the money. And so typically a new mayor will cycle through, new administration cycles through, and they see this chunk of change sitting in the enterprise fund, and they can't keep their hands off of it. And so it, it, it goes. And, and that's what I see time and time again. It's very frustrating to me being a utility operator because, you know, I don't want to see this investment in our area utilities because it just, you know, we're all in this together. And so... You know, we had comments even in our utility when Flint, Michigan happened. We had we had customers calling, you know, hey, there's a problem up here. What about us? And and, and you don't think we're all connected, but we really are. And, and obviously, social media and this whole thing that's happening within technology space is making us even more connected. So the reality is we really, you know, I challenge everyone on the call, including folks in the conference, we're going to have to really stick together and come up with a creative solution. And I don't think it's any one solution. I don't think it's all public or all private or even, in our case, non-for-profit. But I think it's a, a, a portfolio of options that communities need to understand and really execute, in my opinion, a regionalization and consolidation effort because they got to get to scale. Sure, yeah, those are, those are some great thoughts. Jason, I'll come to you next. How do you, how do you kind of answer this, this public-private question uh, from, you know, from a con consulting perspective uh, in terms of the um, you know, the, the differences uh, in between how each of those models kind of kind of work. Yeah, I, just commenting on a couple of the thoughts from the previous speakers is the, the fragmentation in, in the industry is really incredible when you when you look at it. Um, and I agree, it's kind of ended up this way. It wasn't really constructed to be this way. Whenever I get involved in a, a, a utility consolidation effort with our clients, one of the talking points I usually have is is that the the decision to go forward with these things is not easy. It is really complex and it holds all kinds of political and economic and even technical issues in it. And if we were good at it, if it were simple, um, we wouldn't have 53,000 water utilities out there. We'd have a lot fewer of them. So it's definitely not a, it's definitely not simple. And um, I think, Local, local governments are, you know, they're interested in the idea of gaining those kinds of efficiencies and, and doing those things that improve scale. But then when it comes down to where the rubber hits the road, there are a lot of hurdles to get over there. And like I've, I, I said in my presentation coming into the panel, it puts politicians in a very tough spot sometimes. Um, but you know, kind of back to the main question is the uh, the difference in financing of projects is one of the things with, with local government utilities that I think goes missed sometimes is the tax exempt nature of who they are and just by nature the fact that they they don't have to pay federal income tax or state income tax or really most of them don't have to pay tax um, at any level. Um, that's a big advantage, and it plays out not only in the uh, the tax exempt financing that they have available to them from the municipal bond market, which is significant. Um, you know, rates right now, um, you know, we're seeing three percent or below on uh, on municipal bond rates, and that's a pretty flat yield curve, and it has been for quite a while. Um, that's hard to beat. And then on the operating side, of course, you know, that have not having that cost to factor in there is just a built in efficiency that, uh, that, that local governments are going to have over any kind of private entity. 
And um, that's just the way it is. So, you know, if you're talking about going into a private situation from, from uh, municipal to private, one of the hurdles for that is you've got to generate enough efficiencies and all of that to overcome some of those built-in advantages that a local government would have. On the capital project side, one of the, one of the advantages I do see with, with private entities is the ability to bring more types of capital to a situation where investment in infrastructure is woefully behind. And so not just municipal bonds or, or debt, but you know, equity from shareholders and equity from investors that can uh, really change the game and allow for a lot of different, more creative types of project delivery. Um, I'm working on a paper right now where you know, project delivery, um, I, I really feel like project delivery is one of these areas where the private sector has a lot of opportunities for the public sector. Um, one of the biggest issues that I see with my clients right now is on capital throughput. Um, it's not so much being able to find the money for them. So we can, we can do that. We can manage to get them the financial capacity they need to have a high bond rating and go out there into the market and do really well and get the money that they need to do it. Um, but it's about being able to get the projects done once they've got the money to do it. And what, what I see time and time again is you get you, you have well-meaning engineers who will put together a capital plan that addresses all the needs, but it's so much and it's, and it's so front-loaded that they never can really break through that bottleneck and really get those things done. And I see, I see this all the time with master plans that where we've had projects on the master plan for 10, 20, 30 years, and they're still there. They, they just haven't been done. Uh, it's not a question of intent. I think everybody has the right intent. It just literally is a question of resources and the ability to push those projects through. Now, when you're on the private side, there's a big incentive to get those projects done, get them in place, get them in the rate base, and start earning a return on those things through your through your tariffs that are approved by UPC. So um, I think that really is an area of opportunity and one that you know, I think, unfortunately, really hasn't been pursued very much. I mean, we, we hear about P3 opportunities and we hear about the ability to, to have those public-private partnerships, but I really don't think they're being done to the scale that they could be right now. And um, it's, it's, to me, it's one of the more exciting areas where that kind of collaboration with the private sector can really bear some fruit. Sure. So I just want to pause very quickly and reiterate to our, our audience on with us right now. Um, you know, I think you're already starting to see uh, some of the, the tremendous experience and perspective that our, our panelists have here on, on these issues. So we talk about uh, th this question of public versus private and, and anything that, you know, comes along with that question in that in that realm. Uh, please, if anybody has any questions, uh, let's let's get some questions coming in here. Uh, this is definitely uh, the, the panel to, to ask. Um, so, so getting to, to my next question, uh, you know, one of the primary reasons for this panel is to present some, some varying perspectives on the benefits of, of keeping the utility publicly owned and operated versus privatization. And, and we've, we've definitely scratched the surface on, on this already, um, but I, I wanna go to each of you and just to kind of reiterate, you know, where do you stand on that when we think of the, the future of, of water management? Uh, so kind of state your case, if you will, and uh, you know maybe kind of as a, as a follow up to that, how would you sort of uh, maybe respond to a to a proponent of the uh, of 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 somebody who has a maybe a different uh, perspective than that? So Commissioner Holden, I'll I'll come to you first. Probably one of my favorite topics, having been on both sides of the fence. Um, it's it's an interesting subject. I like the the way that Bill addressed it. You know, there's so many options. It's not necessarily that they are every um, public utility should be owned by or should be privatized. There are some very, very well run uh, municipal systems and municipal utility authorities. There are some very poorly run ones and those that reach out or those communities that reach out and want to privatize are oftentimes uh, stifled by special interest groups that really have their just their own interest in mind 
um, that come into a community, get everyone all riled up of how expensive something is going to be. And usually because your municipal system is, it's so personal, your water system, um, it really drives people out to what's going on and really sit up and take notice for the first time instead of just you know, turning on the tap and the water's there or flushing the toilet and it's gonna work. Um, usually these municipalities have come to the end of their rope. They said, this is much too expensive for me to uh, rebuild this uh, treatment or collection facility. Um, I wanna put this out for bid. They do, they have a public hearing and an outside group will come in, stir them up and say, oh, you've got to set this to referendum and they collect petitions, they leave town, the referendum goes down and now the project still has to be done, who's gonna fund it? And you, this, a mayor is left with, okay, I've got to bring it up to referendum again. This time it goes through, project's much more expensive. So I, I tend to, um, be skeptical um, when the do-gooders come in and say, you know, you just have to keep it a public system. Um, there are times when you're surprised. We were all surprised um, earlier this year when Jacksonville said they were going to uh, privatize. We're like, Jacksonville, really? That's huge, huge system. Well, Fast forward a few months, and I believe that the CEO is, has not only been fired, but under investigation and stood to make $26 million himself. The project looks like it was full employment for contractors, designers, you name it. Um, so there's bad privatization. There's probably good things in little tiny systems where a police chief is also the administrator of the town, and they have $350,000 in cash, and they need to replace their system uh, or large chunks of their system. How are they going to afford to do it? So maybe it's a public-private par partnership. Maybe it's a contract relationship, or maybe it is privatization. But all those things are looked at by the Board of Public Utilities and scrutinized before they can take place. We don't have oversight over those once there, those contracts are in place, unless there's a change to them. So uh, I'm, I'm a fan of both. <laughs> yeah, it's it's, it's certainly a, an interesting question. So, Andy, I'll come to you next. You you kind of mentioned uh, maybe some combination of both, or, or, or you know, some sort of uh, P three contract, if you will. What, you know, what are your thoughts on uh, obviously your experience? You know, uh, a, a lot on the the, the public side. Um, you know, where is your sort of stance on on the future of things, and uh, which is the right way to go? Thanks, Andrew. Well, I think, first of all, it, it's absolutely fact sensitive, as, as as Commissioner Holden was saying. I mean, there are um, good and bad on both sides, and it really depends on, it isn't as though one size fits all in every specific instance. However, I do think in general, um, I mean, the one thing we have to remember about the private sector is that they're, they're not philanthropists. Um, they must recover their costs plus profit from their customers, who are the same customers, whether public or private. Um, with that said, there are some inefficient public utilities. So as I said earlier, I really believe the ideal model is the public utility that is, is held to a high level of, of a high standard of efficiency. And I, as I mentioned, the utility that um, that I, I ran in Camden, we only had, had uh, basically 4% total in 24 years. When you count in inflation, that's a 40% rate cut. Well, you know, rebuilding the entire chip plan, opt, you know, being well uh, in, in well above the uh, permit requirements, you know, super compliance uh, with permit compliance, community outreach and community benefits. So that that is possible if you have a well-run, efficient, a public utility using the benefits that uh, you know that Jason described, such as tax exempt, exemption, state revolving funds, grant grant funding. Another advantage is is the public public partnerships because. Those you know, public entities are, are willing and glad to share their information, whereas private entities may be less willing to because of the competition factor. So there, um, there are a, a lot of inherent and innate advantages to the public utilities, provided that they are held to a, a standard of efficiency. I personally found um, that having a standalone authority made a huge difference versus being a division or a department of a city where funds can be you know, siphoned from 
the water utility to the streets or the roads. So I think that um, I think there are there are some public models that are better than others. Like I say, a standalone authority that is entirely in control of their own funds, but they're not completely immune to politics. It's certainly at least one level removed. Um, I also agree that whether it's public or private, I think everyone on this call agrees that it doesn't make sense to have fifty one thousand drinking water utilities and fifteen thousand. Uh, uh, you know, wastewater utilities, and it's in many instances doing what Bill's doing at EJ Water, consolidation, regionalization should be done whether it's public or private. I would argue that, you know, private certainly can do it. Public can also do it. As I mentioned in Camden County, we eliminated 52 treatment plants or reduced 52 treatment plants down to one, and there was a significant uh, improvement in, in, in environmental benefit because discharges to interior streams were eliminated significantly more, uh, more efficient and less costly. So consolidation, public or private, that is absolutely a regional issue to some that should be looked at. Um, ultimately, I think that it, it boils down to uh, this, this notion of the public good coming from the public sector if it is properly monitored and maintained. Uh, the public sector can do things more cheaply because they don't need, need to make a profit. They can widen their lanes to look for, for triple bottom line benefit they can benefit from, from public sharing information from other utilities who are willing to share knowledge and innovation. However, if, if inefficient and not you know, properly uh, overseen, then they can be, uh, it can be bad public as well as bad private. Thanks. Absolutely. So, uh, you know, Rob, you, you definitely laid out your, your case a little bit uh, a moment ago with some of the statistics and, you know, seems like we're, we're just always talking about the the financial challenges in the in the water sector across the board. That's kind of what it all what it all comes down to. Uh, you know, aging infrastructure and all the other. You know, it all comes down to, to financing. So, you know, uh, just kind of to build off your some of your your previous remarks. You know, what do you see as kind of you know as we move to the to the future where this all should go? Yeah, and a lot of this is embedded in, in my prior life when I chaired the PUC. And, and, you know, it was around the 2010 timeframe where working with our state uh, Department of Environmental Protection, we had a portfolio of small distressed water systems. And it was a real eye opener because that number was well into the 3000 range of system operators out there, undercapitalized, small, serving a small universe of customers. So, you know, high, high cost areas. And I think Bill put it succinctly, the, the, the portfolio of options is really where we come down on this. And, and uh, I don't wanna argue with Andy, but there's a reason why the US Postal Service isn't in the water business. And there's a reason why we have Amazon and Amazon Prime. Um, and so I get, I get that, you know, look, in, in a pure world of, you know, a well-run efficient authority, like, you know, New York City or Philadelphia, they're world-class water providers. I could overlay that with the Safe Water Drinking Act and other health-based violations and submit to everybody on this call and everybody on the in the virtual audience that if I took you to Baltimore, or the city of Pittsburgh, or you were one of those uh, negatively impacted citizens in Flint, Michigan, or you're in Newark, New Jersey, dealing with, with, with lead exposure, I think you'd have a much different opinion um, of saying, well, my municipal water system's doing a really good job. You know, the customer service um, uh, benchmarks that we look at from JD Power on down, clearly, uh, express uh, a strong customer sentiment towards private water. Um, and, and that's the numbers tell that story. We also have a much stronger compliance record. Um, you know, not only are we facing economic regulation, uh, which we, we, we recognize rates must be just and reasonable. Uh, they're set through a, through a public input process, but we also recognize safety and all of us on the call, one common denominator, the holy grail to all of us is adherence to the Clean Water Drinking Act, the Safe Water Drinking Act, and that's, you know, there's no compromising there. But where I think we all agree is that those systems that are chronic violators of the Safe Water Drinking Act, they have to find a safe haven. Commissioner Holden has said it best. This is the only public utility service you ingest, okay? Thank God you don't ingest electrons or gas molecules. So 
if we're treating this properly and it comes out of the tap being treated at parts per trillion and we've done proper asset management, the rest speaks for itself. And I've been, you know, in my world of in this job now for two years, I've actually craft been very articulate in stressing stringent compliance. And it's almost like the nuclear industry in this country. The nuclear industry after Three Mile Island has adopted very strong peer review. So our nuclear fleet in this country, not only are they meeting the Nuclear Regulatory Commission standards, they're exceeding that. And that's where we need to be as an industry, public and private. And we need to be peer reviewing those underperforming violators of the Safe Water Drinking Act and find a safe haven for them. It could be municipal on municipal. Uh, it could be a P3 arrangement. It could also entail a privatization or an investor owned acquisition. So I think this is kind of the, to Bill's point, the portfolio of options is, is the pathway forward. Not one size fits all, which some people in the call might think that's heresy coming from the invest, you know, my self interest of representing investor owned utilities. But the fact of the matter is, what we all need to agree to is this that over the next decade, 40 states in this country are going to face water scarcity. As a country, we have the highest per capita water usage, and we're depleting 25% uh, faster than the world our groundwater. So we've got to figure this out. We've got to invest in infrastructure sensibly. We've got to do it with a strong commitment to, to safety and affordability. But let's all agree, these non-performing violators of the Safe Water Drinking Act need to get out of the business. So with, with that said, I mean, I, I, I kind of, maybe we need to reiterate, or I, I don't know if, if maybe it's worth reiterating, what exactly is different about, uh, you know, because going back to Andy's point, you know, perhaps, you know, a, a public model is, is very efficient if it's regulated properly and, you know, there's it's following the stringent requirements. What well, is exactly different that, about that? That's a good point. We're not regulated. You, you know, not, not every public authority in this country, in fact, the majority of them, rates and tariffs are not set by a public utility commission. They're set by the authority board. And I know there's a lot of great technical expertise on some of these authorities. And guess what? There's a lot of political decision making that goes on. I will give one example. I, I don't want to monopolize time. I regulated the Philadelphia Gas Works. It's one of a, one of a, maybe two municipal gas authorities in the country. The Philadelphia Gas Works every year makes a transfer payment to the city of Philadelphia in the tune of $18 million. In 2011, a gas explosion killed three people in Philadelphia. I had hearings on it. It was awful. There was a recent gas explosion. Philadelphia Gas Works had a 90-year replacement schedule of their cast iron bare steel. We forced them to take that down to less than 40 years. And we required that the city of Philadelphia back away from receiving the $18 million transfer payment in order to accelerate replacement of cast iron, bare steel, hazardous pipe. They fought us tooth and nail on that. I find that to be irresponsible, and I find it to go against the conversation we're having here today. Efficient deployment of safe, reliable infrastructure for the customer's benefit. And there are the examples on and on and on where the political decision making, where that $18 million should go to pipeline replacement, not in the city coffers, those decisions are made every day. That's not in the public interest. Yeah, and, and Bill, I'll come to you next. And obviously, as I you know, as I go through and, and throw some some new questions at, at at you guys, you know, if anybody wants to, uh, you know, jump in and address anything that was previously said, you know, you know, feel free. Um, but Bill, just kind of coming back to our our you know our, our question at hand, and in terms of, uh, you know, what you see as the the future, and you know, kind of being a proponent for for you know private or public or what you think is kind of the right the right way to go in the future you know what's kind of your your stance on this area yeah i, I appreciate the question um and and really want to thank the panelists it's been a very uh 
spirited and, and I've, I've learned uh, quite a bit, you know, collaborating. And, and so I appreciate everyone's uh, thoughts. Uh, you know, one thing I want to return, Jason had mentioned about, you know, muni's being tax exempt. I mean, as a not-for-profit NGO, uh, we enjoy the same status. So we don't pay income tax, sales tax, real estate taxes. And, and it does make a difference because I've looked at, you know, that cost of doing business, it's embedded in the rates. And so, you know, that is a very important distinction between uh, entities. But to, to the question at hand, um, I, I'm, uh, you know, I've been at this 18 years, and I, I, I think a lot of this really boils down to um, probably less about the governance in terms of whether it's classified as private, public, or whatever. I think the big concern is, and I think the two biggest drivers, and, and it's been alluded to, uh, because, you know, if, if we're not afraid of Amazon, we should be. Um, and, and when I say that, it's this customer expectation that it's causing. Um, how we do business is changing dramatically. At our utility, uh, we've already implemented chat, you know, on the web through the call center. Uh, we text boil orders out. We text when payments come in and all this type of thing. And actually, and I'm proud to say this, uh, to my knowledge, in Illinois, we were the first utility really to jump to that. Now, you know, like like Bob's saying, uh, you know, this has been going on. Verizon's been doing this crap forever, you know, on the telco side or, or say, Ameren down our way or ComEd. So the big boys enjoy this technology thing. But when it comes to the water folks, we're usually 10, 15 years behind the curve many times. And, and what I see is my, my friends in the municipal side of life, they can't go to the city city council and ask for, say, a $50,000, you know, website improvement to, to increase customer engagement. Because, you know, from the city council perspective, um, what drives them is probably th their Facebook feedback. OK, I mean, they're driven on really the, the emotion of keeping people somewhat, you know, satisfied and, and whatever that's supposed to mean. And, and so I, I'm a little cynical on public governance. And, and, and I will say, you know, Andy mentioned this and others, I see some world-class um, public agencies, you know, folks like, you know, Andy did a fantastic job at his place. George Hawkins did a fantastic job at DC Water. Marty Adams at LA and Jim over at Denver Water. And most of these guys I know on a first name basis. And I, I, I see incredible leaders, but this is the but. The hard part is when the new mayor comes in OK, all of a sudden everything changes and, and you saw this and I and I hate to say this type of comments, you know, with our good friend in, in Baltimore, uh, but I will. And, 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 you know, I mean, it, you get caught up in these political quagmires and, and I've seen some incredible leaders basically get shown the door because they got the, on the wrong side of a political deal. And I find that to be deplorable, it's deplorable to our industry. It's horrible to the workforce. It sends wrong messages to, to our organizations and leadership because it, it ripples through here. And if you don't think is it, you're a manager and you're not worried about the mayor coming in here and chopping your head off, you are because these stories get told. And, and, and it's not publicly talked about, but it's there. And it, it scares me. And, and, I, and that's why in a lot of ways, I'm a little bit cynical of public ownership. And it's not because of the public good, and it's not because you know a lot of the workforce is really good. It, it's this political back office decisions that get made, and the utility is thrown out of the bus. And and, and also, you know, not only I guess workforce, but also like I said, you know, I'm kind of going on some of this IT stuff. I mean, you, you know, let's face it, Uber, Amazon, all those folks are making huge IT investments in AI. Uh, and that, you know, and I'm sure Rob and his his constituents on the privates, I mean, you know, some of the folks I do know a little bit uh, at different organizations that are privately owned. Uh, and I know they're making huge CapEx investments. And, and we are. We're making massive investments. Uh, and we're implementing, you know, I said asset management. We're implementing Tableau for um, uh, business analytics right now. I mean, we hired a, literally a business analyst. Uh, that his whole sole search is just to work on those issues. And the point, like was being said, when you're a smaller utility, you can't afford your own lab, you can't afford your own safety director. You can't hire a business analyst to, to, to drive efficiencies. And that's kind of why I'm a big proponent on regionalization and getting to scale so you can afford to pay people very well, attract the next generation of leaders, and really make a big difference in the public uh, arena 
um, because that's what it's all about. We're all passionate on the call about really meeting the customer expectation, but I guarantee you, if the customers really understood half the stuff that goes on and why certain investments aren't made, and like Bob's point to the 18 million, I, I find that deplorable that 18 million isn't going back into the pipes, but that goes on everywhere and no one talks about it. No one talks about the money because let's face it, the reasons why most of the you know city councils don't want to get rid of the utilities is it's a huge cash cow for them. It's stable money. They don't have to worry about the ebb and flow of the economy. Um, and, 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 and it's it's both a good thing and it's a bad thing. If it's well managed and you've got a great mayor and a great leader and great city council, I don't see the problems. But that's not the exception to the rule. You know, mayors come and go, city councils come and go. And that's the problem is how do you have long term management and long term investment uh, in infrastructure? Um, because the landscape continually changes on you. And, and I'm kind of on a rant. Apologize for that. But uh, to the answer is, I, you know, I like all three models. I believe they all have a place, but I'm very suspect to the governance of because it's the it's the um, it's the Achilles heel, if you will, of what the public side has to face, which is that governance of the elected officials and how that plays in. And, and, and Andy didn't allude to this, um, you know, having it separate from the city council. you got to have that. Um, because that is one standard away from the hot seat, but enough said. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. No, there's some great points, Bill. I, we're actually here in the uh, in the Northeast Ohio area, and I've I've talked to some some former public utility leaders in the area here, and it might not even uh, depend on a, a change of, of political uh, party affiliation that has an impact on the utility. It could it could remain the same, and there could be some different things when there's a you know a, a mayor shake up or, or things like that it's uh it, it definitely has a a huge impact uh so so jason uh coming to you next for for your thoughts on on sort of this um public versus private you know in terms of where we're going in the future you know feel free to address that or or anything else that uh has, has been said here uh, probably from my perspective i'm not as down on the public ownership model as as maybe some of the others i you know there are there are some difficulties there and the political element is certainly challenging. I, I've been involved in hundreds of cases where you're, you're trying, you're just trying to get enough money for the utility to do all these things. And you're just getting held up on that for reasons that ultimately you can't really understand um, because they tend to not appear to be rational. And there's a reason why in this country where I don't know what the number is now, but hundreds of billions of dollars behind on uh, on infrastructure investment. Uh, you know, D minus from Society of Civil Engineers, I think was the recent grade. I mean, um, you know, and, and it's it has to do with how do we pay for these things? What is the, how does that play out in terms of uh, people being able to afford their water bills or being able to, to perceive the cost of the service that they're actually getting? Um, it's tough at times, but, um, you know, where does the role fit for the private enterprises and all of this? And like I said before, I think there are some important opportunities. <laughs> it's funny as, as, as the folks were talking, I was thinking of a place that I lived recently where I could go on a 20 minute bicycle ride and I would go by no fewer than five wastewater treatment plants owned by separate entities. And I'm not even exaggerating there that's that's a true story there's a proliferation that has occurred and in some cases it, like we said before it's just kind of been built that way but i think in some cases it has uh been designed this way and it has to do with you know one of these other political elements that we see and that's who has control over land development and how does how does all of that take place and, and you know in this particular example i'm talking about it's political decisions about who's going to control land development and then who controls land development ends up deciding how the utility services are going to be provided. And then you got five wastewater plants within 10 miles of each other. Um, it's a great example of where that really should not have happened. And, you know, if we had a stronger regulatory framework in place for at that local government level, in certain cases, um, I think that could have helped you know, with those kinds of situations because, now that's that it's just obviously suboptimal you're not achieving scale 
Um, and you never will once you've committed to that kind of model. It's, uh, it's very frustrating. So how can private enterprise really help with that? I've always viewed uh, privatization as being an option for, for that kind of situation because to the extent that um, you can work something out, and I've already mentioned what the challenges are there, but um, I really feel like you know private enterprise is the place where those kinds of ideas can come from easiest because you know if you're expecting it to come from political leaders, you're probably gonna be disappointed. They're very interested in maintaining autonomy over these operations and these facilities. And, um, you know, they're not so interested in some of those other ideas. So, so if it can be driven from that private sector and those efficiencies can be made clear and, and so forth, I, I really feel like there are some opportunities there and it should be welcomed. You know, there, I don't think anybody should be sitting around saying that, hey, you know, it's great that we have 60,000 water utilities in this country when in fact we really need to achieve scale that would only lend itself to something like 10,000. Um, you know, it's, it's just always been an issue. So you know, maybe it works. Uh, maybe that's a good, good model for many to gravitate toward. I like to think that local governments could come together on these kinds of things and agree on a business case that actually makes more sense. I've seen it um, fail more often than it succeeds, unfortunately. And um, that's why I'm saying the private sector might <laughs> might actually be able to bring some advantages there um, in in those kinds of negotiations. I think, um, you know, in my experience, I haven't seen it happen. So I haven't seen a, a a big consolidation going on where we had a you know American Water Works or whatever in there saying, hey, we could actually do this for a lot less. It just it just they're never kind of brought to the table, and it that might be a missed opportunity. Well, guys, we are starting to get some questions in here, and uh, one of them is actually uh, the, the next question I was going to ask you on on sort of technology investment and adoption, uh, which is which is something that we've we've talked about a little bit in each of our sessions for the conference. Um, but we also had another question come in here uh, regarding emerging contaminants uh, like lead pipe replacement. Uh, PFAS is another one that's come up over the course of this conference. Um, this question here, uh, the way this person framed it, uh, you know, perhaps some of the the infrastructure costs uh, related to emerging contaminants, uh, you know, perhaps the public utility scenarios might be a little lagging behind, whereas the private side might be a little more prepared for some of that. Um, but I, I'm going to I'm going to go through I'm, and, and let you guys uh, address one or the other, or, or perhaps a little bit of both. Uh, Commissioner Holden, I'll come to you first. Uh, any thoughts on either? Um, technology adoption and and how that's going to play into uh, future financial planning, reducing costs or resilience, or um, you know any thoughts on kind of on the uh, another separate kind of question, uh, you know emerging contaminants and and what you see as the the future for some of those issues. I'll leave the emerging contaminants for someone else, and we have an open docket on lead service lines, and it's, uh, so I can't really discuss that one. Um, <laughs> But I, I would like to talk about the technology part. Um, this is very exciting at the board right now. Um, uh, President Pallison brought up the um, Seth Siegel's book. And when you read that, it really drives home the, the facts that pumping, processing, pushing water is the greatest use of energy in this country. Um, so. What I've been able to do through our clean energy program is we are actually starting a pilot program to incentivize uh, acoustical testing. This is something that was piloted in New Jersey, uh, New Jersey American Water, uh, working with Ecologics. They have made a detection that can be attached to fire hydrants. There are other companies that use things that attach to the main as well. Um, so it's not that it's picking any winners or losers for um, technology, but the idea of using acoustical testing to be able to determine your asset management. You may have a plan, it may be based on, well, we've got cementious asbestos pipe, we've got cast iron, we've got whatever. Um, in some cases, we still have logs in New Jersey. Uh, <laughs> that you know, it has a certain life to it. Well, all these things are supposedly coming together, converging, that their lives are, are over. 
And so how do you pick where you're going to work your asset management? This acoustical testing maybe will say, I've got nine miles of pipe that I plan to replace. Well, when I do the testing, I'm finding that eh, five miles of it's still in pretty good shape. So why am I going to replace the entire nine miles? I'll just concentrate on that those four miles. That frees up a lot of CapEx for other projects. Um, it also is a way that this acoustical testing, we can eliminate breaks, um, we can find leaks before they become breaks, um, and that's gonna save a tremendous amount of money at the um, plant because you're not spending all that extra money on electricity to um, move the water, process the water, but also the chemicals that'll be saved. So that's something that's going to be rolled out this week, um, million and a half dollars from our clean energy program for just a pilot program. Um, we hope it becomes popular. Um, we've already seen some numbers from other municipalities uh, around the country that have saved a tremendous amount of electricity. In fact, it was astounding to some of our people, our clean energy division, when they really studied it. So we're hoping that's gonna be successful. Um, of course, there's biogas as part of the, um, the governor's energy master plan. Um, we've already, I know in our little wastewater plant, we have captured methane off the digester to just heat the digester at night. But there's other combined heat and power um, ideas where you can actually feed the digester and save that to run the entire plant and island the plant. Um, and I also take exception with that the private companies don't share information. That's not true. I know in the case of Suez, they uh, one of their affiliates is a software developer. They have developed software to optimize their, their plant so that it becomes more efficient electrically. And um, they're willing to share that not only with you know municipalities, but also with other um, private utilities. And they've, they've made that very clear. So there's some great opportunities and there's a lot of value in um, sharing this information, but uh, it's not all artificial intelligence. Um, one of my biggest regrets as mayor is that I was not able to push through AMI for water. We still have water meter readers. We still have water meter readers that carry paper books, but we have really pushed forward because I can now take a picture of my water meter and I can email it to the borough for my bill. But uh, I, there is great hope. We just went AMI with all our electric meters. So perhaps there's a platform that can be integrated for the water. But uh, it, technology shouldn't be feared. I think it will make us much more efficient. Absolutely, and Andy, I know you probably have some thoughts on that. I'll, I'll, you know, same question. If you want to address some some points on technology adoption or uh, or emerging contaminants, we'll do. Thanks, Andrew. Uh, well, first of all, I think that for either public or private, you know, uh, sector, it, you know, it's wise to see to to strike the right balance of appetite for risk. Um, when people, you know, as a wastewater manager of a you know relatively large facility, you know, uh, an 80 million gallon per day treatment plant, um, you know, I was often, you know, approached, don't you want to be the first to try this or try that? And I always felt like I want to be the third or the fourth. I mean, I, I don't, I want to be an early adopter, but I, I think it's important, again, public or private, because ultimately the public sector has to get rates back from their customers, so does the private sector. And so we all want to, to have caution with respect, and respect to technology. But on the other hand, we don't want to be afraid of it because we want to provide, ultimately we want to provide the optimal service at affordable rates, public or private. Um, so for example, like in my utility in Camden, we did implement a combined heat and power program. Um, like, and our wastewater treatment plan is entirely off the grid. And that was a good, that was a good example of how a, an efficient public utility can take advantage of the state revolving fund to fund those projects, but also take care advantage of public private partnerships. So, so you know, the idea is, is that you want it, to, it, it, as everyone has said in this panel, there isn't one size fits all. You know, you don't want to just only have a hammer in your toolbox. You want to use a screwdriver or pliers, et cetera. So um, in the case of the solar panel project, that was an entire you know, P3 project um, and where the, the, the private entity installed these solar panels 
and sold back the electricity at a third of the price that we could get from the electric company. In the case, the uh, you have to build it, but it was a design build project with a private entity. So I think the idea is, is, is to be, as Bill was saying earlier, to be flexible and look for the best opportunities. Um, but I think, you know, again, you want to, you do want to use caution. I am glad to hear that, that there's private, private sharing. Um, that my, my usually feel, feeling about it is that like if McDonald's knew how to make a better hamburger, they wouldn't want Burger King to know because they're you know, rivals, but it, it may be different in some instances, in the private sector, but I know in the public sector, I've benefited greatly from learning from like our combined heat and power project was barred directly from East Bay mud in Oakland. And our solar panel project was you know, barred from Atlantic city, New Jersey, and our green infrastructure project was barred from Philadelphia. So, you know, a lot of, you know, if you're looking to optimize your performance, um, there are, you know, a lot of performers in the public sector that are willing to share information. So I think there's a benefit there, but there's no doubt that, um, you know, technology advancement is critical for us to solve this infrastructure gap, which I know is going to come later in this question, you know, this discussion and, and Jason already, you know, uh, alluded to it. The fact that, you know, the water infrastructure has been graded at a, a D, D plus. We have a, a huge infrastructure gap. In addition, that infrastructure gap is exacerbated by climate change. And even if there are those who don't believe in climate change, you can just look around and, and, and certainly in New Jersey, climate history with Hurricane Sandy or Puerto Rico or Houston or the Gulf Coast, you can see that the infrastructure is already inadequate for how the climate is now, even if it doesn't get any worse. So there's a, a gigantic you know, infrastructure gap and technology improvements, you know, being careful and judicious about selecting technology can make a big difference. Uh, and, and needs to be addressed. The last thing I'll say quickly about it, emerging contaminants is that the one thing I really think is important, uh, drinking water and wastewater treatment plants, public or private, is that we are purveyors um, of, of public health. And, and in many instances, you know, the wastewater treatment plant is the last, you know, the last bastion before, you know, waste, sewage gets into the river and the drinking water plant is, is, you know, directly protecting the public health. So anything that we can do, of course, wastewater and water utilities, public or private, need to meet the permit. The permit compliance should definitely be a, a, a floor, not a ceiling. And, and the ceiling should be to optimize performance. And so, for example, in the case of like microplastics, if a wastewater treatment plant optimizes its solids removal above and beyond permit compliance, better than permit compliance, it can capture sol you know, plastics that go with the solid phase and protect the river. So I think that, um, you know, that is one thing that uh, I mean, ultimately, you hope that microplastics will be eliminated and, be, and you can get them at the source. But in the meantime, our water and wastewater treatment plants truly are you know, protectors of the public health. And through super compliance, if compliance is better than permit requirements, we can make a huge difference. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, so, so, Rob, coming to you next, uh, you know, will you hear from uh, a lot of your members uh, in terms of, the, you know, what's where we're headed with technology adoption or uh you know, as a part two to that, anything on uh, emerging contaminants? Yeah, so in our world, I mean, obviously, you know, to, to just echo what's been said earlier, I mean, 2% of the overall energy usage in this country is coming from drinking in wastewater, um, accounting for 30 to 40% of our, of our OPEX. So for us as an industry, uh, and I think in New Jersey, uh, being kind of a, a real good beta test for us, where we've instituted energy efficiency, we've used solar installations to Commissioner Holden's uh, credit, you know, biogas capturing into a CHP process where you can manage that thermal load. Um, that's a great story. By the way, to the, to, to the earlier point that Andy mentioned, a lot of this conversation now, whether it's climate related or weather event related, is our industry as a whole is deathly focused on our our grid resiliency, our assets uh, being able to survive these events um, now more than ever. And so I think as an industry, we continue to innovate around filtration. Uh, we're, we're trying to in, 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 uh, institute new disinfection techniques. I share a great story that's emerging both in the private and in public sector in the world of COVID, and Commissioner Holden led a conversation on this, it actually caught the airwaves of CNBC back in May, and I'm sitting there like stunned, but there was a company, and by the way, it started in, in Cambridge, Mass., a company called Biobot, and they are tracking waste streams 
to monitor where we're seeing COVID patterns. University of Arizona averted a massive breakout in one of their college dormitories by using this type of technology. So I think Andy put it succinctly, in the business of public health, and here we are today using technologies in the world of COVID to avert outbreaks um, by just monitoring waste streams. I don't know, I, I, you know, I could not have thunk that, excuse the pun, um, 18 months ago. I didn't even know that technology existed. And so I think it's a great story um, on emerging contaminants. Look, we've taken a, going go back to my earlier point um, about stringent compliance. Look, we've taken a position as an industry that the people that created the problem, the polluters should pay. We shouldn't be putting consumers, rate payers, I don't like to use that word, they shouldn't be put on the hook to pay for remediation of generation equity failures by, I will leave the companies nameless. And so we have come out, we've told the EPA this, that the polluters should pay. We should, we will, we as an industry will continue to monitor, detect and treat. Um, but at the end of the day, I think we're headed for some, you know, tobacco settlement like uh, mechanism to shield consumers from what they never caused. The good news is everybody on this call, I guarantee you the, the investments we're making to, to make sure drinking water is safe. Uh, there's no wavering in that. The only other piece of the con conversation around con emerging contaminants is the EPA taking two hours to watch 60 minutes to make a decision on setting from going from a health-based standard to setting um, to setting a, a national standard. So kudos to Governor Murphy, kudos to Governor Newsom and other governors that said, we're not gonna wait for the federal government um, to come out with an edict. And that's caused a lot of problems for us as an industry because it's created this checkerboard approach to regulation. So I don't want to you know, be Debbie Downer on the EPA, but they really need to get, get their act together in moving forward with the implementation of, of a standard for, for PFAS. Bill, your thoughts on on either, uh, you know, tech, technology adoption, uh, you know, as it, as it kind of applies to resilience or, you know, it, the impact on financial planning, or uh, as I said, the kind of a sec, sec, second question here uh, about emerging contam contaminants, either of those you want to address? Yeah, thank you. Um, I mean, emerging contaminants, you know, it's coming. We all know it that are in the industry. For those that have been in the industry a long time, I mean, it used to be pretty simple. We checked, uh, you know, kind of chlorine levels and, you know, it was pretty basic uh, back just a few decades ago. And now, you know, we're we're looking at a whole host of not only uh, current regulations, but obviously this emergency emerging contaminant list that that uh, we're all having to kind of uh, figure out. And, and and at some point, as we all know, it's going to become part of the the baseline moving forward. Now, you know, it, this is a very uh, tough thing to talk about because I, I'm a complete proponent on uh, public health, and so I don't necessarily have a problem with uh, meeting new standards. I don't complain about them. I think it's a good thing. Uh, the problem that we really get into is, you know, how as an industry do we continually make investments in treatment um, to meet these new standards? Um, you know, and, and, and more importantly, how do we continue to educate the public uh, of, of rate increases and why that's happening? I mean, a lot of times, you know, we, we're talking about basic infrastructure stuff now, but once you start running down the, the rabbit hole of emerging, emerging contaminants, I mean, that's kind of a whole different animal. And really, you know, some of our, some utilities, like, you know, like we have a marketing department, uh, we're very active um, in doing video calls with, with our members and live Facebook chats and all those types of, you know, new things that, that you know, more traditional companies do. But we're doing it mainly because uh, I want to keep our, our uh, rate base informed. Um, and it really takes the heat off of our board of directors because the board doesn't have to be the one, you know, constantly, you know, telling everybody the bad news, if you will. So, you know, this is a big area and it's only going to get, I think, worse. Um, and it's going to be a tough challenge, especially for a publicly uh, owned, uh, you know, municipality owned, you know, utilities. 
because they're not that great. I mean, you know, most of us that run utilities are not marketing experts or, you know, ran Pepsi or ran, you know, more commercial businesses. You know, we're, we're typically very technical in nature and we don't really have those business skills normally. And so it's a very difficult uh, subject to talk to. And, and on, a, on a case of new technology, I mean, you know, some on the call knew, and I guess I'll toot our own horn, we won the 2019 U.S. Water Alliance Award for, for innovation last year. And it was because of really some of the innovative things that we did, in particular, why we got the award is we started putting fiber optic cable in every time we were trenching in a water line. And, and we're, we're interested in smart metering. We're, we're hooking up all of our SCADA assets on a private uh, uh, network. And, uh, and, and to the point that uh, Commissioner Holden mentioned, you know, it's funny, you know, we did AMR drive-by uh, meter reading back. We started that in 1993. And, and right now we're 40% implemented on, on, you know, daily AMI, you know, so we know what everyone's using on an hourly basis. So that's kind of where the industry's heading. Um, and so we're trying to use those tools to really better predict, um, you know, how do we roll assets? How do we, how do we uh, uh, have problems? I mean, one of the things I was just talking to our business analyst today is, is almost putting a profit and loss on a GIS map so we can better understand capital deployment, Where's our costs uh, occurring? Where's our revenue coming in in terms of a physical location? Um, because that makes a big difference and it, it helps us sell to the board. How do we make uh, improvements um, on, all, on all fronts? And so, you know, having some of these new technology tools, I think is going to be uh, paramount in us to, to educate our, our elected officials uh, or in my case, board director, um, and, and so we we totally embrace technology, but I do agree with uh, comments that that uh, Mr. Cricken mentioned. You know, we typically don't like to be first, but we do pilot a lot of things, knowing that a lot of things are going to fail. Uh, thankfully, our our again being a little bit bigger utility, we have a budget similar to a lot of Roberts, you know, constituents. You know, American Water has a budget. You know, that they're always looking at new stuff. And, and, and so, again, being a little bit larger, you can have a budget to try things. And, and thankfully, our board of directors, you know, they're very aware that we're always trying stuff. And we kind of have a um, an R&D committee, if you will, that's always talking about new stuff. And so we're always trying stuff, and we know there's going to be costs. We know there's going to be failure. But, but it also gets back to uh, an organization that's willing to take risks, uh, especially for the public good. Uh, now we're not going to waste money and, you know, we, we do kill projects pretty quick when we realize they're going to go south. But um, I think it's important to, to, be, a, a, to be an adopter um, of new technology and not be afraid of it because, again, it gets back to customer expectations. I think that's going to probably be the biggest driver that's going to probably move the, move the train faster than a lot of us are comfortable with because customers are expecting world-class communication. They're going to be expecting world-class uh, service and, of course, obviously expecting us to deliver on uh, environmental uh, uh, requirements and, and, and do it in an affordable way. So. Jason, if I could uh, maybe just frame this one for you really quick, you know, something that's that's come up quite a bit throughout this conference is, you know, when we talk about technology adoption, you know, I'm wondering uh, in your position, you probably talk a lot with utility CFOs, you know, you're dealing with the finance people, how much does technology adoption kind of you know, make it to how much does it impact folks in the, in, in those roles? Well, yeah, I mean, I would, I would say the comments that have been made before about slow adoption are spot on. Um, you know, if we're looking to the government sector for innovation, you're looking at the wrong place. That's, that's not a great place that you're going to get it from. And it, you know, in, in the water industry, a lot of that has to do with the constraints of our regulatory environment. You know, the EPA and even state regulators, they're slow to, to do things. And, you know, if you go out and you get too far out ahead of that stuff, you run the risk of having expended a lot of money for nothing. Um, you know, I, I could give you a specific example of a startup I was working with that was going to deal with lead contempt, you know, the lead service line issue uh, from a, remediation perspective rather than a full replacement perspective, um, pioneering technology, well, not pioneering the technology, but importing the technology that had been proven just fine in the United Kingdom for uh, dealing with the issue. And, you know, here's EPA 
as we're trying to get this business plan up and going, um, coming out with their lead and copper rule, making it mandatory that if you have a lead service line, you're gonna end up having to replace it, not remediate it. So that was the end of our plan. I mean, risk taking um, and innovation is a level of service and you have to be willing to pay for that level of service if you expect to get it. Um, you know, that's what we don't see in the government sector. So that's, that's why it's just so slow. Um, and again, this is another area where the private sector really has some opportunities, um, but you know, unless we're able to parlay that into the regulatory environment as well, uh, I just feel like you know, we're kind of, it's like trying to push a rope, you know, it, you come up with all these great ideas and then you've got a regulatory environment that doesn't support that kind of thing. And, uh, you know, in our case, the case I was giving you as an example, the science was all there. There was absolutely nothing wrong with the science. It was proven. And you had a regular regulator who didn't want to hear it. You know, they, they had a prescribed plan for how they were going to do it. Not interested in regulating water quality, which is their actual mission, but interested in regulating how you were going to make that work, which I felt was totally inappropriate. It is inappropriate. But um, yet here we are. I know we're out of time. I didn't want to uh, spend too much time well, on this comment because I just uh, feel like you probably need to wrap up. But well, I'll yeah. I mean, with with that said, I mean, yeah, we are almost out of time. I wouldn't mind uh, just if if you all I, I'd maybe just go to each of you for some very brief uh, concluding remarks, maybe thirty seconds. Uh, you know, I, I, we've we brought it up a couple of times, kind of the the big industry statistics, the AWWA trillion dollars over the next twenty five years, and you know, I think EPA has, you know, several hundred billion on the wastewater side is needed. Um, you know, the, the ASCE report card, you know, what is really needed as we kind of go forward? Is it strictly a financial equation or is or is, is anything else needed in terms of, uh, you know, really where we go in the future for uh, water management? Uh, Commissioner Holden, do you want to make some, just some brief uh, remarks to conclude? Yeah, uh, the... Um... One mil, the one trillion dollars, I think, is always going to be there because if you do a, your asset management correctly, you're constantly moving it and coming back to where you started. Um, so I don't think that's the going to break that number at all. I think you need regulation of infrastructure, which is something I would like to see. That's me personally. Um, I look at Wisconsin as a great model, not only a private but also public is um, regulated. But the parting thought I'd like is that we talked a lot about Amazon and oh, how terrible, but you know, all of us had all those, I have more uh, cardboard boxes than you can imagine at my, my house uh, from this uh, pandemic. But you know, you have an expectation with Amazon and you maybe you pay $99 a year for that prime delivery, but you, know, you get eight pounds for every gallon of water, less than a penny a gallon, delivered to your door when you want it at that moment, you can't get that kind of delivery from Amazon. And that's something we have to respect in the water industry. Absolutely. Andy, uh, concluding thoughts? Uh, thanks, Andrew. Well, I totally agree with, with uh, Commissioner Holden. I mean, I think public or private, uh, the water service is, is a tremendous service, protecting the public health and the environment. And of course, during this COVID situation, uh, water workers across the sector are you know, essential workers and, and to protect the, the public health. Um, I think with regard to this infrastructure issue, I mean, number one, and I think everyone on this panel would agree that we must invest in infrastructure. A D grade is not acceptable. Um, and the thing is, it's not gonna go away. I mean, and you know, it's roughly uh, an emergency repair is five to seven times more costly than a planned you know, replacement or, or, or repair. So it, it's like that old saying, you can pay me now or pay me, living. and we should, we, we should do it now. We must do it now. And there is such a ripple effect from doing so. By improving our infrastructure, we create jobs, we help to protect the public health and protect the environment. I think so investment in, in infrastructure is important, but I also think that it just can't be a, a you know, a handout from the federal and state government. I think it's not an either or question, but a both and question. We do need investment from, from the, the federal government and state governments, you know, additional investment to help us close that infrastructure gap. But public utilities at, you know, and private must charge full, full rate pricing, must find a way to, you know, to bring, to come to the table as well to, to uh, pay for infrastructure improvements. Also must 
adopt efficiency measures so that those dollars are being spent well and wisely and as well as possible. And lastly, we have to make sure that there's an affordability component. We can't leave low-income households behind so if we're making an infrastructure investment, we can't make water service unaffordable for low-income households. There has to be a safety net, like like LIHEAP for heating and energy, like a LIHEAP app, a low-income water assistance program, so that so that water utilities, public or private, don't have to have this terrible tension between doing the infrastructure improvements that they need, but then having to shut shut people off who can't afford it because the rates have necessarily gone up. We need to improve our infrastructure and have a safety net um, for uh, for low-income households. And we've gone to the moon. And so we came up with the way to, to do both. Sure, yeah, LIHEAP for water and other ongoing disruption. Uh, Rob, any uh, final thoughts? Well, the last two have encapsulated. I'll be very brief. Yes, LIHEAP for water. Commissioner Holden just led an effort at our National Association. We have a resolution passed requiring or encouraging, excuse me, Congress to act on eligibility of LIHEAP for water and wastewater companies. Totally agree, long overdue. Um, look, at the end of the day, I'd like to say there's only two states in this country, New Jersey and Indiana, that have water quality accountability measures. We need a national measure, and we need to all agree that underperforming assets that are in violation of the Safe Water Drinking Act, we need to find a way to get them either in compliance or in type, some type of safe harbor. And that's why we've worked with Senator Braun and Senator Duckworth on the partnership language uh, that gives opportunities for these underperformers to find a home before they create a public health crisis. So at the end of the day, I mean, the trillion dollars, I look, I look at where we are, never thought in all my regulatory wor world of training I always was trained for a black sky exercise, not a pandemic. And I'm sitting here today saying to myself, wow, there's not going to be a trillion dollars coming from the federal government when we have a $4 trillion budget deficit. And there's not a state government or a governor in the country right now that is probably sitting on a surplus saying his number or her number one priority is to fund water and wastewater infrastructure. That's the new reality. So I think of it in, in our world where private investment capital is really the pathway forward. Bill, any final thoughts? Uh, yeah, and I, I, I agree with, uh, you know, Robert's points. Um, I, I don't see the checks coming from, you know, in our case, Illinois or, or the federal government because it's, it, we're just not going to be the priority. Um, I, I do urge... Um, us as an industry probably to look to our friends in the electric industry and the gas uh, is an example of how scale and regionalization can work. I mean, you know, I know Robert mentioned about the 1,100 gas, you know, utilities in the U.S. I mean, in Illinois alone, I think there's 62 muni-owned gas. And then, of course, you got the big boys, you know, People's Gas, NICOR, and Ameren down our way. Um, and the point is, is that on the electric, it's the same type of thing. We have to get to scale. Scale can actually provide efficiency. It can provide, when you, when you actually can, can buy 10,000 pickup trucks a year, you know, imagine if we had a Costco for our industry. You know, everyone is like a member of Costco. And you literally say, I got to buy 50,000 tires. I want to buy 4 million meters. I want to buy, you know, you're talking directly to General Motors and you say, I want to buy 300,000 trucks this year. I mean, you know, how we do procurement and, and why we don't do it on a more nationalized basis is beyond me. Now, I know why we don't do it because of we got the strangest procurement rules across the entire nation. It's just nuts. Um, and then, you know, one thing that's aggravating, say, in Illinois is we've got this prevailing wage requirement on CapEx and it totally hand ties a lot of these smaller utilities because they can't even afford to make the kinds of maintenance and replacement cost decisions because, again, and this isn't an argument whether pro or con on prevailing wage, but it's a reality that when you're trying to replace things and you just added because of a regulatory, in this case, prevailing wage, that's another 20 to 30 percent more cost. And then we sit around and we have these talks, oh, well, the federal government should subsidize that or somehow the subsidy should come from somewhere else so the ratepayers don't have to pay for that decision.
And I guess one of the things that, that I would love is I would love the, the gloves to finally come off. And what I mean by that is that we need to really have some honest discussions that we have made decisions in the last, say, 10, 20, 30 years that have had a lot of unintentional consequences, and we're all paying for it. And, and so I think it's, a, it's, a, it's an opportunity to kind of reframe, reload, and reprioritize really what's important and really think through some of the frameworks of what we've caused by a lot of decisions that have been made. Uh, and, and I do preach this idea of regionalization. One, one small example is, you know, in our little area, we've got three towns that are about two, three miles from each other. Well, guess what? We didn't put three little water towers in every single town. We put one water tower to serve all three towns. And it's because we wholesale the water to all three towns. And, you know, the, the little town has its own little utility. Um, but it's it's really difficult. And one thing that hasn't been talked about is just the level of embezzlement that goes on in these smaller utilities. Because there's no accountability. There's no, you know, you got one person taking the payment, one person doing the bank statement, one person handling all the money. And, and it's just rampant in these smaller utilities. They just don't have the kinds of financial controls uh, that you, you would have, obviously, in the larger utilities. So I, my perspective, of course, is more on the smaller utilities, but it, we, we really can do a lot better um, than what we're doing. Thank you. Jason, Jason final thoughts? Yeah, I, I think uh, a lot of what I wanted to say would have been said already, but uh, you know, efficient deployment of capital to get the kinds of efficient infrastructure needs taken care of ought to be a priority, and um, you know, I, you know, one of the one of the ways that we ought to be thinking about doing that is, if fragmentation is an issue today, and it is, and it prevents us from reaching scale and those kinds of efficiencies because it does, one of the things that we ought to be doing is making sure that we're not proliferating it at least if we can. If we can dial it in and consolidate more, we should certainly do that, but we shouldn't be allowing it to continue. And we have been doing that. Um, some of the examples that I gave earlier. And I've encouraged state leaders at the state level where I live to take a heavier hand on some of these, uh, you know, what are mostly local decisions that are um, adverse to uh, the, the utility infrastructure decisions that are being made, those have long lasting impacts on communities and you can kind of permanently put yourself in a state of suboptimal scale. Um, you know, that, that just needs to get addressed. And, you know, unfortunately the willingness of policymakers to really talk about these issues just doesn't exist. They talk about infrastructure when it's convenient for them, usually when it comes to things like creating jobs suddenly out of the thin air because there's this huge backlog of projects that needs to get done. So they think it's a optimal place to go to, to do these kinds of things. But what really needs to happen is taking a really fundamental look at what's going on in this industry and how we can do it better. Because yes, affordability is a huge concern. It's growing every single day. I write a lot about it myself all the time. And I've been deeply involved in affordability issues in the industry. Um, and it's not going to get better uh, without that kind of conversation taking place. So things like what we're doing today, um, very constructive towards that. Um, having something that takes place at the state and federal levels from that, that point of policy and governance, to me, would be even more impactful. Um, I wish we could see more of it. Well, with that, uh, I think that's a good place to, uh, to wrap up. So. Apologies for going a little bit over time, but thanks for uh, thanks for sticking with us, uh, gentlemen. Commissioner Holden, it's been a pleasure. Thanks for uh, taking the time out of your day. I really appreciate it. It's a great discussion. Thanks.